Our reading today is going to come from the book of Habakkuk. It's going to be Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2 to 4. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2 to 4. And I'll give you all a little moment to find it in your Bibles. And if we're there, we'll go ahead and read. It says, How long, O Lord, must I call for help but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Well, this week, we're shifting our focus from the New Testament back to the Old Testament, to the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk. So I thought it appropriate to begin today by trying to explain who was Habakkuk. Now, many of us probably don't pay a lot of attention to these minor prophets in the Old Testament, but Habakkuk is one that is of special interest, first of all, He's not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. Now, it's unsure of exactly when he prophesied, but from the information in this prophecy, we can gather that it was written between the Babylonian conquest of Assyrian Empire and the Babylonian conquest of Jerusalem. So somewhere in between the years 612 B.C. and 587 B.C. Now, the name Habakkuk means he who embraces. And this is a perfect name because Habakkuk, the prophet, comes to strong faith through asking very difficult questions of God. The times that he lived in were filled with a lot of turmoil. There was a lot of violence, a lot of injustice. A lot of corruption, a lot of wars going on in the world. And upon Habakkuk himself seeing all these evils going on, he comes to, comes to God and he's saying, God, you are all powerful. You are all powerful. You can control all this. And Habakkuk's frustration hits a fever pitch and he cries out to the Lord He's, with these questions. He says, how long? How long? Now, what does he mean? How long? How long are you going to allow these things to happen? How long are you going to allow bad things to happen to good people? How long are you going to allow injustice to be in the world? How long are you going to allow violence to be here? How long are you going to allow the religious people to oppress others? How long are you going to allow us to live under this system that we're in? He was frustrated. I mean, God, you are in control. How can you possibly say you are all powerful and yet you're allowing all these things to happen down here? His rant is justified. He has legitimate concerns. And seeing all the injustice, all the violence going on, he has a concern. And God, how can you just be up there in heaven and see this and not do anything about it? Do you not care? Maybe you're not even there. Because surely if you were there and you saw this, you would take action to do something about it. Well, he cries out to God with his how long, and God responds. God responds. And God's answer to Habakkuk is probably something the prophet did not expect. Because God's answer is, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, which are the Babylonians, 
And I'm going to use them to bring judgment upon Judea and Israel because of all the things that are going on. I'm going to allow them to come in with their army and take Judea, take Jerusalem. And that will be my judgment upon the people. Now, we can kind of think maybe Habakkuk in his mind when he's asking how long, he's trying to get God to just come down supernatural power and eliminate all these things and make everything right. So when God answers him and says, I'm going to bring judgment upon the people by allowing the Babylonians to come in and take over, that's probably not what Habakkuk was thinking. That's probably not what he had in mind. It's like, you're going to use our enemy to judge us? This isn't the first place in Scripture God does this. God does use ungodly people, ungodly nations for God's purpose. And he's chosen the Babylonians as the instrument of justice upon, instrument of judgment upon Israel. But then, after God answers Habakkuk, and he gets this answer that the Babylonians are going to come in and take over, Habakkuk then cries out again, Why? Why are you going to use the Babylonians to come in? They're brutal. They're vicious. Why are you going to use them? And God answers. God answers him by saying, I'm using them because of the, all the injustice and all the bad things I see going on in the nation, <coughs> that I'm going to use them as my instrument of judgment upon you. Because they are the strongest army, and they are the one that can come in and bring the most judgment upon you, and that's why I'm using them. Because they are brutal. Because they are vicious. And you can think, God is probably using this as a teaching moment to the people of Israel. He's going to use it to humble them. He's going to use it to get them to come back to him, because they've lost their way. They've lost their way. And they come in... And they take over. And Habakkuk has that answer from God. But when we think of this story of Habakkuk, try to turn this around now into our 21st century context. See, we today in our nation, just in our community, we can see injustice going on everywhere. We can see bad things happening. Innocent people getting hurt. False testimony against people. We can see people treated differently just because of the way they look. We can see people that we would consider evil being elevated to positions of power or people that are good are being torn down. We see corrupt people getting rich. We see good people getting poor. We see people being manipulated. We see wars being fought. We see violence. We see riots. We see injustice everywhere. So the modern day believer, when we're looking, we also see so many people turning themselves away from God to the world and living the way the world wants us to live. So again, the modern day believer would also be justified like Habakkuk in crying out to God, how long? How long are we going to allow hate to infiltrate society? How long, God, are you going to allow racism to be a part of our society? How long are you going to allow people to suffer in poverty? How long are you going to allow wars to break out? How long are you going to allow people to kill each other in the streets? How long are you going to allow corruption? How long are you going to allow people that are evil to be in control of certain areas? How long are you going to allow good people to suffer? That's a justified complaint because many of us in the church can look out and we see people that we perceive to 
to not be good people, it looks like they're getting good stuff and the good people are not. And we'd have to be blind to look out and not see that certain people are treated a certain way based on what nation they came from or what they look like, even what gender they are. We see it all the time. And then we come to something, and I'm not going to get political here, but something that's supposed to be civil like a debate. And we see this going on in a debate. And then we wonder, why do we have to choose between one of these two people to vote? If people really wanted to be good, wouldn't they treat each other in a civil manner? Wouldn't they be nice? Wouldn't they be respectful? It's a very difficult feeling when you try to be nice and polite to others and they treat you with disrespect and they treat you like you're not worth anything. When people who try to make a difference, people who are very godly people suffer in poverty, suffer there, they go month to month wondering if they're even going to have a place to live because they could get evicted. They can have their electric turned off. The pandemic has brought a lot of pain and suffering and financial hardship on many people. So again, in our society, we can cry out, how long, God, how long? We cry out, how long, in our own circumstances, in our own individual lives? How long am I going to be unemployed? How long? Am I going to have to suffer loss? How long is this pandemic going to last? Lord, how long do I have to suffer betrayal from people I thought I could trust? How long, Lord, am I going to have to endure a bad relationship? Or how long am I going to have to go on my own without being in a relationship? And it goes on and on and on. Whatever you want to put in there, all of us have dealt with one of these things one way or another. And all of us, justified in our own hearts, can cry out to God, how long are we going to have to endure these things? But just like Habakkuk, if we are going to cry out to God about how long we have to endure these things, we have to be prepared for God's answer. And there's a lot of times that people will cry out to God and they are not ready for the answer. Because the answer is, and especially when God's involved, the answer is most likely not going to be something we expect. It's very frustrating. Very frustrating. To move forward without really knowing what God's will is for our lives. Without knowing if it's God's will for us to do this or to do this or to make this decision or to not make this decision. And many times we hesitate on things. Many times we second guess ourselves because we're not, well, was this God's will or was this not God's will? But many times we don't discern God's will because we're not listening for God's will. Or many times God tells us his will and we don't want to accept God's will, so we pretend like we didn't hear anything. Or it's like, no, that can't be God talking because I know God wouldn't want me to do this. I know God wouldn't want me to make this relationship. God wouldn't want me to sacrifice that part of my life. But you know what? Maybe God does. Maybe it's not God's will for us to live the way we're living, and that's why we're in the situation we're in. There's a song out right now by Matthew West, a Christian singer, and the title of the song is Do Something. And in this song, he talks about seeing all the injustices in the world and all these bad things going on, and he said, God, why don't you do something about it? Well, in the song, God provides an answer. 
And after he's crying out, God, why don't you do something? Why don't, people are suffering. They're hungry. They're starving. They're losing their homes. There's violence. There's all these things. Why don't you do something about it? God answers, and God's answer is, I did. I created you. So what does that tell us? We are not just innocent bystanders as the world goes by. Now as Christians, yes, we are set apart from the world. We are no longer of the world. We are now citizens of heaven and we are just in the world. But by no means does that mean that we just sit here and allow the world to go on and we not take any part in it. If we are true children of God and true citizens of heaven, if we truly have Christ in our hearts, then Christ lives within us. And if Christ lives within us, then Christ should work through us. And if we are not allowing Christ to work through us, is that God's will? Does Christ come to dwell within us and say, okay, now you can just be a hermit and sit at home and just lock yourself in and not do anything, regardless of what's going on in the world, that's not your concern, just stay here and wait to die to go to heaven. But you know that a lot of people out there that think that way, well, I'm saved, I don't have to do anything, I'm just going to wait to die and go to heaven. That's not what God intended for us to do. How can we have Christ within us and see our neighbor suffering and not care? How can we have Christ within us and see injustice in the world and not care? How can he, we have Christ within us and see racism? How can we have Christ within us and see murder? How can we have Christ within us and see all sorts of evil things happen in the world and not do anything. God created us and Christ dwells within us. Therefore, we should do Christ's work in the world because that's what Christ would do if he were here. You know, if Christ were here right now, he would probably not be with us in the church. He would be out among the people doing God's work among the people. There's an old joke that I remember from my childhood about this family and during this big flood and they're up on their roof as the water's rising. And they're saying, God, please rescue us from this flood. So God sends a boat. And the people in the boat say, hey, come on down. Let's get you out of here. No, no, no. We're waiting on God to save us. And a little bit later, a helicopter flies by. Come on, we're going to take you out of here so you don't drown. No, 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 we're okay. God will save us. Well, the waters go over their head and they drown. And they end up in heaven and they go before God. And, and they go, God, we were calling out to you to save us. Why didn't you help us in that flood? And what was God's answer? I did. I sent you a boat. I sent you a helicopter. See, that joke reminds us that when we call out to God and when we're asking God for help, we need to really pay attention to be able to recognize God's response. God doesn't always answer us in the way that we would answer something. But God will answer the faithful. A prayer of the faithful, God will always answer. Now the answer may be no, but God will answer. If we're in trouble and we're faithful and we're believers, God will answer and give us that way that we can get out of it. But we need to be willing to listen. And most of us men out there get accused of not listening. We can hear, but we don't listen. But all of us out there need to be attuned to listen to God. 
Now, will God always speak in an audible voice? No. Sometimes God speaks to us through dreams. Sometimes God speaks to us through other people. Sometimes God speaks to us through actions. Sometimes God speaks to us through music. Sometimes through nature. Sometimes through something we read in scripture. But if we are truly listening, we will hear God's answer. And just like Habakkuk, sometimes God's answer is going to be something we don't like. God can say, all right, you don't like this? I want you to be the one to head up the people to go out and take care of it. Now, it reminds me of a former pastor I used to have. He was talking to me one day, right before I entered the ministry, about people in the church coming to him and saying, hey, it would be a good idea for our church to do something like this. And he would say, you know what? That's a great idea. Why don't you head it up? And they say, no, 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 I don't want to be ahead of it. I just think it would be a good idea for us to do it. See, we all can come up with some thing that we want to see happen. But what good is it if we're not willing to be part of the solution? If we're waiting on other people to take action, to take care of it, it may not ever get done. So if you see something out there and it really pulls on your heart, that's probably God saying, hey, I need you to take action on this. Now, God had to use the Babylonians to bring judgment upon the people of, of Jerusalem. Don't think it's outside of the realm of possibility that God can use an outside force to bring judgment upon us. You know, our American culture, especially, we are in a position where I dare say that we're arrogant. That we feel like we're the most powerful nation on this earth and there's no one out there that can challenge us. But that's exactly the kind of attitude that we don't need to have because that shows we're not home. And people that are arrogant are in line to be judged and to have that judgment brought upon them. So let us not sit back and say, hey, we're all high and mighty and nothing's going to happen to us. We're good. What did God do to Jerusalem? He sent the Babylonians in. God could do the same thing to us today. And in many ways, he may already be doing that. The church has been silent far too long on things. So maybe God has brought judgment upon the church by allowing other things to come into society because the church remained silent and wasn't active. And then we think, well, what can I do by myself? I can't make much of a difference. There's an old quote that says, how can you change the world? One person at a time. One heart at a time. Now, I know people that want to go out and work for social justice. They are, their heart is in the right place. But I tell them many times, your focus is in the wrong area. Until there's a change in the hearts of people, there will not be a change in this behavior. There's always going to be injustice. There's always going to be racism. There's always going to be all these other bad things in society until there's a change in the hearts of the people. And how... Can that change come in the hearts of the people? It comes through the church sharing Christ with them. Getting out and living a Christian lifestyle. Getting out and sharing the gospel. Helping people come to know Christ. That when they accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, their hearts are changed. Their views are changed. And you look no further than the Apostle Paul. When he was Saul, he was one really bad dude. But when he came to know Christ, he was changed and transformed into this 
wonderful, godly man who was bold for the gospel. But that only happened because he came to know Jesus Christ and accepted him as Lord and Savior and the Holy Spirit dwelt within him. But if we're going to expect worldly people to change just because we go out and do something, that's not going to happen. They have to come to know Christ. And when the people come to know Christ, then real change can begin. So our duty, our obligation as children of God is to take a stand for injustice, to stand for the truth of God's word, to share the gospel with all people. And sadly, the church has failed on a lot of these things. The church has sat back and allowed injustice to happen. The church has sat back and not been bold on the truth because the church doesn't want to deal with the backlash from the world. And that's led to where we are now in our society. It is not a suggestion. It's an obligation. We have to get out and live boldly for the gospel. We have to take a stand. And regardless of which side of the political spectrum you are, I'm going to say I really admire and respect Vice President Pence for what he said in his debate on the issue of abortion. He said... I proudly stand as pro-life. How many Christians are willing to say that? To put it out there like that and, and put our, set ourselves up for the backlash from the world. But he said that. So I respect him for taking that stand. And taking it in that public forum where it was. That's something that the rest of us could learn from what he did. Let's not be timid about our faith. What does Jesus say in scripture? He said, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before the Father. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny before the Father. Our faith is not something that we are to keep to ourselves. It's not something that is a personal thing that we just lock up in a box and we have it there on Sunday morning and then we put it back in the box and store it away until the next week where we can just live within the world for the week and not bother anyone about our faith, not do anything to share our faith. That's not what we're called to do. So back to Habakkuk's question, how long? In our society, the how long depends on how long are we willing to sit back and not do anything. It's time that the church got up off our laurels and lived as Christ calls us to live. How long is the church willing to sit back and allow the world to destroy itself? We're better than that. If we truly love the way we're called to love, we should want to do something to make it better, not just sit back and allow it to happen. The longer we're silent, the worse things are going to get. So let's turn that question that we have to God of how long into a question of, Lord, what is it you need me to do? God is sitting back waiting to use us for his glory. He wants to, us to be there, his hands and feet in this world. And if we're tired of asking how long, let us get busy and do something about it. When we talk to our neighbors that may be the only opportunity they ever have to hear the gospel so God puts people in our path for a reason 
Let's not waste that opportunity that's put before us. How many people have we missed the boat? I know I'm guilty. Many times I don't even think about it. But if we truly want to make a difference in the world, if we truly want the world to be different and move toward Christ and be more of a moral society, we have to be willing to do something. So let us get out there and live as we're called to live. When Jesus was on this earth, he didn't care who was listening to him. He didn't care what village he was in. He didn't care where he was. He stood on the truth of God's word and he was public about it. He spoke the truth regardless of who was listening. He spoke the truth even knowing that it would be rejected. But he gave us the example of how we as Christians are to live our lives now. We are to go out and be bold just like Christ was bold before all people. He came and he gave himself up willingly on the cross for every life. And yes, there are people out there that we can't stand. There are people out there that are evil. There are people out there that have done horrible things to us. But you know what? Jesus died for them. Even the most evil person that ever lived. Jesus died for them. Let us not allow our flesh to interfere with our spirit. The gospel is for all people throughout the whole world. And until the whole world knows Christ, there will always be injustice. There will always be evil in the world. But we can start one person at a time. Jesus invites everyone to come to him. Everyone to accept him as Lord and Savior. And if there's anyone who is watching this message who has not yet accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior... In a moment, we're going to pray. We're going to pray to lead you through accepting Christ. And then we'll pray for the rest of us. And if you would do accept Jesus Christ today, if you would, just let us know, either through email or a phone call or on Facebook. Uh, we'd be happy to get back in touch with you and help you as you begin your spiritual journey. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, <coughs> I know I'm a sinner. I know I've done things I shouldn't do. I've said things I shouldn't say. And Lord, I also know the opposite is true. There are times that I should have said something that I didn't. There are times that you've called me to do things that I haven't. But Lord, I know that you are Lord and Savior. That you came into the world to save me, to save all sinners. That you are all-powerful God, all-knowing God, all-present God. So, Lord Jesus Christ, I ask that you forgive me for my sins. I repent of my sins, and I turn to you, and I invite you to come into my heart and live as Lord and Savior of my life. And, Lord, I surrender control of my life over to you. And I ask that you guide me and lead me where it is you need me to go to do your will in this world. And Lord, for those of us who have already accepted you as Lord and Savior, may your Holy Spirit energize us. May your Holy Spirit refresh us and renew us in our faith. May you give us what we need to go forth so that we no longer have to say how long, but that we can actually do something to help the situation and turn the how long into how soon. Lord, we love you. You are 
our Lord and Savior, who are our Creator God. And we commit ourselves to doing your work in this world. And all this we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.